What happens when you feel that the tools of music are no longer sufficient for expressing your artistic vision? When the sickly sweet sounds of the strings, the tireless bleeding of the brass, and the plinkety plunk of the piano don't make your ears happy anymore? The answer is simple. You invent new instruments. Now this isn't as easy as it sounds because if you want to invent new instruments, you have to understand how to build them, you have to understand acoustics, you have to understand construction. There's a whole bunch of things you have to do. So one easy way you can invent new instruments is just by squeezing new sounds out of old ones. This is known as extending technique because you're adding to the repertoire of techniques that exist for a given instrument. A young man named Henry Cowell, who was born in 1897, did exactly that. When he was a very young man, he developed several new ways of playing the piano and extending piano technique. One of these was called the tone cluster, which is best explained by saying that Henry Cowell smashed his entire elbow onto the piano keyboard, hitting 14 or 15 keys at once. This was his new technique. Another technique he developed was opening up the lid of the piano and reaching right inside and strumming the strings of the piano like it was a guitar or reaching in with his hands and scratching them with his fingers to make a very eerie, haunting sound. This sort of extension of technique can apply to all sorts of things, whether you're talking about plucking and slapping a bass guitar, scraping the strings of a piano, or even something as simple as playing a bassoon in an extraordinarily high register. Stravinsky did this at the beginning of Rite of Spring, and at the time it was quite revolutionary, but now it's almost commonplace. Any bassoon player worth his salt today can bust that out, no problem. But sometimes, even that's not enough, and you're forced to invent brand new instruments. This is exactly what Thaddeus Cahill did, and he was enabled to do this by one simple thing, electromagnetism. By the beginning of the 20th century, the principles of electromagnetism were well understood in the scientific community. Basically, the idea is that if I have a magnet and a coil of wire and I move one relative to the other, I get an electrical signal. Well, this is really fascinating stuff, and it opens up a whole world of possibilities. These are possibilities that Cahill explored. In 1897, Thaddeus Cahill filed the patent on what was to become known as the Telharmonium. In 1906, he presented the first fully complete model in Holyoke, Massachusetts. The Telharmonium was a musical instrument, but it didn't produce its sounds by vibrating strings or vibrating air columns or a brass mouthpiece. In Cahill's words, it produced sounds by synthesizing them. It synthesized sounds by using spinning metal wheels. This was all based on electromagnetic principles. Well, how exactly? Quite simple. One thing that you could do is you could pass current through a wheel. Let's say you had a wheel that had teeth on it, like my fingers, and I put a metal brush out like this. If I'm passing current through here, as the wheel passes by the brush, it makes contact, then it doesn't. It makes contact, then it doesn't. It makes contact, and then it doesn't. Well, this produces an electrical signal that goes bip, bip, bip. And if you filter it the right way, which Cahill did, you get a sine wave. Now, Cahill had studied the work of Fourier, and he knew that theoretically you could reproduce any sound by stacking up sine waves the right way. And this was exactly the process he was using in the Telharmonium. He realized that if he made enough of these wheels and spaced them out on a rotating shaft and made them the proper size relative to the harmonic series he wanted to create, he could literally create almost any sound by engaging brushes or not engaging them as necessary. And this is in 1906. Having done his math, he knew that he was going to need more than just the fundamental wheel. He was going to need maybe six for each octave. This meant that each note needed about six feet of shaft in order to create the proper sound. That meant that a five octave keyboard had 30 feet of shaft rotating. Most full size pianos have eight octaves on their keyboard. The Telharmonium weighed about 200 tons and was about 60 feet long. The whole thing was supported by giant iron girders on brick supports that were 60 feet long. It was connected with over 2,000 switches. It took 30 flat cars on a railroad to move a small one. And yes, it was portable. And when assembled, it had the resemblance of a small power station with these giant dynamos turning these enormous shafts. 
The quoted cost to build one was $200,000, which was a staggeringly large sum in the early 1900s. The giant instrument occupied the entire floor of Tell Harmonic Hall, which was located on 39th Street and Broadway in New York City for 20 years. The resulting sound was audible by acoustic horns built from piano soundboards in early models. The instrument was usually played by two musicians, so you had four hands, and was generally used to reproduce the respectable classical music of the day. This, of course, being people like Bach. So why build such a giant, unwieldy instrument that, without amplification, could barely be heard by more than one or two people in a room? Cahill was going to use the telephone. His idea was that all you had to have was a telephone. You could pay a little fee to the phone company, and then at any hour of the day, you could pick up your phone receiver, set it on the wall, and hear this synthesized music coming out wherever you were. Suddenly, music was going to be democratic. This was a big deal, because right now, if you wanted to go hear music, you had to get dressed up, you had to try and buy a ticket to the symphony, go all the way out there and wait and accept whatever pieces the performers happened to be playing that day. But with Cahill's invention, anyone with a telephone could afford to hear classical music coming into their homes, hotels, restaurants, anywhere, for next to nothing. And he had not only envisioned this entire network, but he had also envisioned the instrument that was going to provide the sounds for it. There was only one problem. Again, there's no amplification, so that meant that the volume of the telharmonic signal was purely dependent on how much current they were pushing down the phone wires. Well, the telharmonium pushed about one amp down each wire. The problem with this has to do with another fundamental property of electromagnetism, which is that if I have two wires running parallel to each other and a very strong signal on this one and a very weak signal on this one, some of this signal bleeds over into this one. The problem with that is that Cahill's building is in New York. It's near Wall Street. So the traders of the day couldn't complete their trades because every time they picked up the phone to close a deal, they heard Bach. It's important to note, though, that the telharmonium sounded really good and did things that synthesizers wouldn't be able to do until the late 50s and early 60s. The telharmonium had polyphonic velocity-sensitive keyboards. Now, what I mean by that is that you could play more than one note at a time, polyphonic, and they were velocity sensitive, which means that the harder you hit them, the more different the sound was. This is like a regular piano. If I press the key softly, it makes a very different timbre than if I bang it really loud. The other interesting thing about Cahill's keyboards is that they didn't have 12 notes to an octave like a typical piano keyboard does. They had 36. Well, there's only one problem with this. Who knows how to play a 36 note keyboard? What do you do to solve this problem? Cahill was a genius, way ahead of his time. Too far, in fact. The telharmonium ultimately proved to be an expensive failure. But his work was not completely in vain. A businessman named John Hammond would adopt the basic principles that Cahill had developed for the telharmonium and apply them to an organ. Hammond invented things like clocks, a bridge table that automatically shuffled, and 3D film glasses. In 1933, he got interested in music, bought a used piano, and started working on his idea for a small, portable electric organ. You can imagine the market. I mean, pianos are, are big, heavy things and very difficult to move, and they're expensive, so making a small, portable electric organ should make him a ton of money, right? Hammond was a business guy. He wanted to make a lot of money selling instruments. He didn't want to innovate or change the world, so he was all about cutting costs. Too many pedals, he noticed that people weren't using the pedals on the organ, so he got rid of all but the ones that he saw people using the most. He looked at Cahill's method of creating synthesis and said, ah, there's too many wheels here, I don't need that many, I'm gonna cut them out. So he reduced it down to its simplest essence. His Model A appeared in 1935 and was accompanied by a massive marketing campaign. He continued to update and improve the organ and brought out the small portable B3 in 1936. And is, this instrument is still being played today. It is the first successful modern electronic instrument. It does offer some tone shaping possibilities and does generate its sound with the same tone wheel design that Cahill had invented in the early 1900s.